Hello, my name is Dan Goldwasser, and I'm an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at Purdue University. My research focuses on a specific branch of artificial intelligence called natural language processing, an area that studies how computers deal with human languages. This field has seen tremendous progress over the last few years, allowing us to perform human language understanding tasks at a level that would have been unimaginable until very recently. In this video, I'll discuss some of the ethical concerns that emerge from this progress, touching on the risks of developing complex AI systems and the way that these systems can be used. Unless you have made intentional efforts to avoid them, headlines such as these have surely caught your eye by now. An AI technology called transformers, which are a specific type of a neural network architecture, and a specific implementation, GPT-3, have shown an impressive ability to process or read text and generate an appropriate response also in text form. Unlike previous attempts to build NLP systems that are designed for a specific task, for example, predict the sentiment of a product review on Amazon, these models are not tied to any specific task. They are called language models, and they are designed to generate relevant text given a prompt on just about any topic that exists. As suggested by the articles I point out in this slide, this include common sense knowledge, generating short romantic stories at a level that can be difficult to tell if it was written by a computer or a person. When thinking about artificial intelligence risks, these kind of sci-fi images tend to appear. The question of whether human-level AI is achievable is beyond the scope of this video. However, a much more direct risk stems from the fact that even imitating such capabilities in a convincing way is enough to have serious implications. If humans cannot tell computer-generated language from human-generated language, should we limit its use? Is it okay for an automated customer service agent? How about generating comments on Twitter? Should we be concerned about the content such systems might generate? Can we trust them to generate correct responses? How about good responses that align with our values? To help put things in perspectives and understand the actual risks involved in this process, let's first take a very quick look at this technology. Let's start by playing a simple game. I'm going to mention a word, say the first thing that pops into your head. Ready? Blue. Any of these options would have made sense. Blue cheese, blue moon, blue sea, blue car, blue blood, but not blue sun. If we add more context, for example, the sheep moved quickly through the blue, then the list of reasonable options is much smaller. Just a single word, C. Modern NLP systems rely on large language models that learn to do just that. They learn to guess the missing word in a given context. To understand why this is useful, consider the input the states that the Blue Ridge Mountains extend through are, and the result would be a list of states capturing useful geographic knowledge. To get some idea of how the model works, consider a simplified neural network trained to play the missing word game we just looked at. In the left of the image, a list of node activations captures the word in the input sentence. For example, meow said the on the right, the activation of an output node indicates the predicted word, cat. In this simplified view, each node is associated with a single word. The key elements in a neural network are the hidden units, which are trained to identify the interactions between input words relevant for predicting the right output word. The success of large language models can be attributed to two factors. First, the size of the neural networks is enormous, typically with hundreds of millions and often billions of parameters used to identify hidden interactions between inputs. Second, the massive amount of data used for training the model to produce coherent language. 
Unlike task-specific approaches, which require human judgments, the training regime that predicts the missing word does not require any human annotation and can potentially use any openly available text online. With a better understanding of the technology, we can assess its risks, which touch on the way the technology is used, perceived, and who has access to it. Concretely, we would like to examine the following questions. What applications of this exciting technology might be harmful, either to individuals or to specific populations? Given the enormous amounts of data used for training these models, can we ensure that we do not expose information about individuals? Would the authors of the data consent to it being used for the intended applications? Note that publicly available does not mean consent. The data is generated by humans, and as such, it captures their biases, which can be reflected in the behaviors of systems trained on this data. Does the data represent some populations in a biased way? How about the environmental cost involved in training this system? The technology requires massive computational resources which have a significant carbon footprint. Finally, who gets to enjoy the benefits of this technology? The development efforts are mostly directed at frequently spoken languages, mainly English. This can potentially widen the technological gap between the English-speaking and the Western world, and speakers of other languages for which such resources do not exist. In the rest of this video, I will focus on some of these concerns. Recall that language models depend on having access to large amounts of text. Since no direct human supervision is provided, the models would incorporate patterns observed in the data. To understand the risk, look at data obtained from Google Photos when searching for pilot as opposed to flight attendant. Models trained over this data would associate pilots with mostly male and white characters, potentially also wearing a tie while flight attendants are exclusively women wearing blue outfits. This, of course, has nothing to do with the underlying concept of either profession. It is just an artifact of the data. In text, gender is also represented, although in a different way. For example, through the use of the pronouns that code gender. It is a lot more likely to see pilots in the context of he rather than she or the gender-neutral they. As an example of what can go wrong, consider the following language technology application, coreference resolution, which identifies mentions of the same underlying entity in long text. In the first sentence, the surgeon could not operate on his patient, the phrases the surgeon and his are identified as being coreferent, meaning that they point to the same underlying entity. However, when changing the gender indicated by the pronoun to her, the system fails to identify the surgeon and her as being coreferent. This is an example of how a systematic bias in the data leads to the wrong model prediction. The wrong predictions have a cascading effect called bias amplification, meaning that systems trained over biased datasets will not just reflect this bias in their, in their predictions, but also increase it. In this example, if we were to trust the predictions of the model on new, on new datasets, the proportion of surgeons associated with she would decrease even further. This is not just a theoretical issue. For example, this headline describes a system that was tested and then scrapped by Amazon for screening job applicants' CVs. The system was trained over 10 years worth of applicants and learned to penalize resumes by female applicants, downweighting resumes with phrases that included the words women's X, such as women's clubs or women's teams. The data represented the male dominance in the tech industry and hired applicants were overwhelmingly male. A continued use of this system would have resulted in an amplification of this bias. This also points to another issue. The objective that the system should have been trained on is who is a good applicant. By looking at their qualifications, instead it was trained to recognize who was hired in the past. Labeling the data for the right objective is much, much harder. 
which increases the risk that systems would be trained on historical data, making the resulting model more susceptible to biases. This research work looked at predicting prison time given a case description in text, with the hope of automating this process in the future. When assessing the risk of such a system, we can look at, it, at its performance, which shows that the system was often wrong. However, this only tells a part of the picture. There are so many ways in which bias can enter the process. Then the names of the defendants can identify them as belonging to a group that can be a victim of discrimination. The case report itself might incorporate bias based on the language used to describe the case. And finally, even the labels themselves corresponding to prison time can potentially capture the bias of past judgments. Given those high risks, we can ask, is this an ethical research problem to work on? The NLP advancement that we discussed were made possible by scaling up the models and the amounts of data used for training them. The graph on the right demonstrates the bigger is better paradigm, showing that larger models perform better and that this trend is yet to converge. This has serious implications. First, these models have a significant carbon footprint, and increasing their size would increase that footprint too. Second, these models are extremely expensive to train, and only a handful of industry stakeholders have the ability to train the models that dominate the AI field. This can potentially limit access to them and reduce the ability to study their potential biases. Finally, I would like to discuss how these issues should be approached. There are no easy answers here, no silver bullet that can reliably keep up with the technological changes. There are, however, algorithmic approach that can help us detect and reduce social bias in learned representations at different stages. For example, by actively resampling the data to create unbiased datasets, or by designing training objectives which take fairness into account as a desired outcome, in addition to direct performance measures such as precision or accuracy. However, at least for now, ensuring ethical NLP is a human-based process, which requires us to ensure we make the right choices at multiple stages in the process. When formulating the research problem or the downstream application, can we identify who will benefit and who can potentially be harmed? When collecting the data, can we ensure that we have the author's consent for the intended use? Is the data representative of the population it will be used on? Does it describe any populations in a biased way? When adding human judgments to the text that the model will aim to replicate during training, can we make sure that the instruction to the annotators describe the process in a clear way? Also, can we ensure that the annotators are compensated fairly? When designing the models, can spurious correlations be captured by the models? Are we using the right objective function? After training is concluded, what are the impacts of using the trained model? Does it perform at different levels for different populations? Does it increase the bias that was observed in the training data? Discussing these questions is now a condition for publication in all major NLP publication venues. However, this only pertains to the academic settings. My hope is that this videos and others like it will help promote awareness for this issue more broadly.